How's everybody doing? Come on now, you can do better than that. How's everybody doing? Doing all right? Yeah. Well, I am so glad to be here. I'm kind of freaked out a little bit because I'm kind of the last guy to be a preacher. I don't come from a typical religious, Bible-reading, church-going, pew-sitting, hymn-singing family. I come from a family filled with bodybuilding, tobacco-chewing, beer-drinking thugs. And that's just the women. I mean, I was, oh no, yeah. Three of my uncles are title-winning bodybuilders. The fourth uncle could bench press 500 pounds. The fifth uncle was a Golden Gloves boxer. I do not know what happened to me. I was at the bottom of the gene pool. But one by one, my family members met the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was a radical transformation. You gotta understand, my family was tough. The Denver Mafia, I was raised in Denver, Colorado, the Denver Mafia knew my uncles as the crazy brothers. So when the Mafia thinks your family is dysfunctional, that's bad news. But I think of my Uncle Jack, my Uncle Jack, the toughest one of my uncles, been in and out of prison his whole life. Bodybuilder, tattoos everywhere, talk like this. He was even scared to talk to, it. get right in your face. How you doing, Greg? Pretty good. How about a Tic Tac, Jack? Just back it off, right? Again, in and out of jail all of his life. But then one day, a preacher from the suburbs heard about Jack from one of Jack's friends named Bob Daly. And Bob Daly was a Christian. And he knew Jack, but he was too afraid to share the gospel with him. So he dared this preacher. This preacher went to his house, knocked on the door. The main door was open. The screen door was shut. Up came Jack. No shirt on, ripped. Two beer cans, one for drinking beer, one for spit and chew. You did not want to get those mixed up. The biggest German shepherd you'd ever seen in your life named Lobo. I think he actually gave this German shepherd steroids. You know, listen to me now, my name is Lobo, huge, huge dog. He's, my Uncle Jack said, what do you want to this preacher? This preacher said, well, I'm a pastor from the suburbs, and I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. And Jack said, well, I don't know Jesus, but I know Bob, so come on in. And for the next few minutes, this preacher explained the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to my Uncle Jack. Now, my Uncle Jack, all of his life, had heard about religion, that you had to be good to get to heaven. He thought, well, if you've got to be good to get to heaven, there's no way I'm ever going to make it, so I'm going to have fun and go straight to hell when I die. But for the first time, he heard that Jesus loved him enough to die for him on the cross, that he rose again, that he offers him eternal life through faith alone in Jesus alone. This preacher says, does that make sense to my Uncle Jack? My Uncle Jack thought about it for a moment and said, hell yeah. That was a sinner's prayer. Hell yeah. He believed in Jesus in that moment and was transformed. Boom, from darkness to light. And it was awesome. It was awesome to see. The problem is, have you ever met like a new believer who doesn't know all the rules yet about loving your neighbor yet? That was Uncle Jack because, listen, he started telling everybody about Jesus. And if you didn't accept Jesus, he'd give you Moses right upside the head, right? One day, he's in a sauna, and he's sharing Jesus with this other bodybuilder. There's another guy, another bodybuilder that, from a different religion that wants to argue with my Uncle Jack, and he keeps interrupting. Michael Jack's sharing the gospel. The guy interrupts. He looks over at this guy and says, hey, I'm trying to tell this guy about the love of Jesus. Why don't you shut your stinking mouth, all right? Shut it. He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts again. My Uncle Jack says, you interrupt one more time, I'm taking you out. He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts again. Boom, Jack nails this guy. The guy falls to the ground, looks up and says, well, Jesus didn't go around hitting people like that. He goes, well, I ain't Jesus. I'm Jack. <laughs> Name is Jack. One by one, my family members trusted in Jesus Christ. My mom put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I was able to lead her to Christ when I was 15 years old. My Uncle ba Bob trusted Christ in the back of a squad car. My Uncle Dave trusted Christ. My Uncle Tommy trusted Christ. My Uncle Richard trusted Christ. My whole family was transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My family was tough, but they met somebody tougher. They met the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the problem is you may not think of Jesus as tough. And it's probably because you've seen a movie about the life of Jesus. And in every movie about Jesus, you ever notice he's always a six foot two skinny white guy? Kind of floats through the crowds. 
He looks at you with his Jesus eyes. I am Jesus. You are healed. Jesus was not a six foot two skinny white guy. Jesus was a Jewish carpenter before they had power tools. These were his power tools, right? I, I want to see, I want to see a new movie with a new Jesus who's kind of ripped, who's buff. Would that be awesome? Could you imagine like Arnold Schwarzenegger like 30 years ago being Jesus? Listen to me now, disciples. <laughs> Pharisees, you will be terminated. Hasta la vista, Satan. Before he ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, I'll be back. And there he goes. It'd be awesome. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. See, all the stereotypes about Jesus are wrong except one. There is something special about his eyes. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. See, these thousands of people that follow Jesus, he saw them differently. He saw behind their smiling facades, down deep into their soul. He saw their hurts and their pain and their hopelessness. I want to talk to you about what it means to have Jesus eyes, to see people differently. This pastor from the suburbs that reached out to my Uncle Jack looked past his tough exterior facade and deep into his soul. You have friends that desperately need Jesus, and you need to see them differently. See, Jesus' eyes help you see the unseen hurts of those around you. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. You know, that word compassion literally means to suffer with. He saw the crowds and his heart was broken for them. His heart hurt for them. Too many times we look at others who are outside the Christian camp we judge them. We're not called to sit on judgment on them, but we're called to extend the grace of God to them, just like somebody did to us. I remember years ago, I was preaching at this men's event called Promise Keepers. It was in Baltimore. There was 10,000 men at this event. The problem is nobody knew who I was, and I was one of the preachers, so I had to keep my name tag with me, my badge to get in the speaker van, to go over to the arena, to get into the actual arena, to get backstage. Who are you? I'm one of the speakers. Oh, let me see. Oh, okay. I don't know who you are, but you're a speaker. You got a speaker badge. They let me in. I needed that speaker badge to get everywhere. And finally, that afternoon, Saturday afternoon, I preached my sermon. We're getting in the van on the way back to go back to the hotel. And we're leaving the venue in the busy streets of Baltimore, right across the street from the venue. There was a group of lesbians protesting. I knew they were lesbians because they had a big sign that said, we're lesbians. And I said, lesbians, pull over. And the driver was like, lesbians? And he pulls over. And I get out of the van, I ran across the street, I go, hey, what are you guys protesting? We're protesting promise keepers because they hate gays. I go, hey, I'm a promise keeper speaker. I don't hate gays. I showed them my badge to prove that I was a promise keeper speaker. They said, well, you think homosexuality is a sin. I go, I do, but you don't. Well, they, they said, it's not a sin. I go, you know what? We could argue about that all day. Let me ask you a different question. Are you a sinner? And they're like, homosexuality is not a sin. I go, no, 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 we're not going to talk about that. Are you a sinner? Have you ever lied? And they were like, yeah. Have you ever cheated? Well, yeah. I go, well, we got something in common. We both lust after women. And they were like, ha, <laughs> And in the next several minutes, I saw the walls come down and we had a conversation 
about the God-man who loved them so much that he died for them. And we had a real conversation in the middle of those streets. In those moments, what I saw in front of me were not a bunch of lesbians. I saw girls who were looking for love in all the wrong places who were victims of the enemy's lies. God's creations who were bought into a warped view of God's blueprint for sexuality and exchange it for something less. I saw sinners just like me who desperately needed the grace of God just like me. I saw girls who were hurting down deep inside, longing for something more, looking for something more. I saw myself before someone introduced me to Jesus Christ. Listen, we need to see past the picket signs. We need to see past the facade. And we need to see people in desperate need of the love of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus' eyes help you see the unseen hurts of those around you. They also help you see the unseen hopelessness of those around you. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep without a shepherd. See, in this culture, if you were out and about in the countryside and you saw sheep without a shepherd, you knew it was just a matter of time. Sooner or later, they'd be torn apart by wolves, the many wolves that roamed the countryside. Imagine a flock of sheep out in the middle of this wilderness and these wolves that are circling them one by one, they would charge in and grab a lamb and tear it apart. The others would disperse and soon they would die. They would be harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd because there were so many predators. I live in Colorado, where there are a lot of wild animals, a lot of predators. You have to be very careful when you go to the mountains. Just a few weeks ago, my wife, my kids were up in the mountains, 25 foot, feet away, a mountain lion was underneath a bench in the middle of a housing community in the middle of the mountains. We have coyotes, we have bear, we have mountain lions, we have rattlesnakes, a lot of that stuff in Colorado. And I was born and raised in Colorado. When I was a kid, my grandpa used to always take me up to the mountains fishing. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, we went out, we went fishing, we got out of the truck, we went down this, this, this mountainside, we made our way to the river and we were fishing and my grandpa wanted me to go back up to the truck and get some stuff. And I'm 10 years old and I am terrified because I know there are bears all over the place, there's mountain lion all over the place. So I make my way up this hill and I push back this tree branch and sure enough, right in front of me, two feet away, I am eye to eye, face to face, with a little lamb. Right in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. And I am frozen. I am praying it's not an attack lamb. Bah! You know, attack. I'm like, what is happening? And I realized all of a sudden that somehow this little lamb had escaped its pen and wandered into the wilderness. And I knew, I knew that if I didn't catch it, and find a way to bring it back to its owner, it would be slaughtered by a bear or a coyote or a mountain lion. And so I lunged at it, and it ran away, and I remember chasing it, chasing it through the woods, trying to catch this lamb, and I couldn't catch it. And I remember being brokenhearted as a 10-year-old kid because I knew that lamb was gonna die. That's the same compassion that Jesus calls us to have with our friends that don't know Jesus because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 1 Peter 5.8 says your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Your friends who don't know Christ are being harassed by a prowling lion named Satan. He's out to hunt them, to kill them. Most of you in this room know of someone who's attempted or committed suicide. Who do you think was roaring in their souls before they pulled the trigger or took the pills? It's not just suicide, though, whether it's cutting or drugs or looking for love in, in wrong places. Your friends are being harassed by this invisible enemy. They're lost in the wilderness, and we must chase them down. We must realize they're lost little lambs, and we must catch them with the love of God. We must do what it takes. We must see the unseen. What's going on behind the smiling facade? It's not just with your friends. It's with strangers you meet along the way. Years ago, I was at the grocery store with my little son, my little baby daughter. My wife was up 
cleaning a grandma's house. It was Sunday after church. And I was just going through this grocery store as fast as I could because I knew it was nap time for my little daughter. My five-year-old boy is kind of spastic like his dad. And I'm just trying to get, get through. I'm going through the bottled water and juice aisle. And I'm just booking through there. And this lady goes, sir, can you help me? And I didn't really want to help her, to be honest with you, because I was in a hurry. But I'm like, okay, sure. I go, what do you need? She goes, um, can you read the price tags on the bottled water? Because I left my glasses. I lost my glasses. And I'm like, sure. Uh, so I help her read okay, which, which bottled water costs what. And I'm saying goodbye, but she wants to talk. She's like, yeah, I lost my glasses. I'm just a mess. I go, why is that? She says, because I lost my dog. I go, well, what happened? She said, I had a one-year-old Great Dane puppy. He ran out in the middle of the street. He got hit by a car. If she'd lost her cat, I'd have just kept moving, you know. Bummer. Life goes on, you know. But she lost her dog. And I'm, I'm freaking out a little bit because she starts to kind of tear up and starts crying. You know, I'm a guy. I don't know what to do around girls when they cry. It's like they're on fire and I'm trying to put them out, you know. Stop, drop, and roll. It's okay. Don't cry. No, no, no. Shh, 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 shh. We're in the middle of the grocery store. But my little boy knows what to do. He's five years old. His name is Jeremy. He goes, it's okay, lady. Your dog's in doggy heaven. And you can go to heaven too. Daddy, tell her the gospel. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. And I just trained him how to share the gospel using the gospel hand, a kid way. I go, you tell her the gospel. He goes, okay. He goes, look, lady, God loves me. I have sinned. Christ died for me. If I believe, I will go to heaven. He goes, see, lady, if you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven with your dog. And she's looking at him like he's a little freak. And so am I. And all of a sudden, this lady just bursts out into tears. She goes, I'm so mad at God. Now everybody is looking at the meltdown in aisle nine. She goes, I'm so mad at God. She said, I, I lost my son to cancer and I bought, a dog, I bought a dog to comfort me in my grief and now I've lost that dog. I went through the house and I took all the pictures and paintings of Jesus. I ripped them off my wall. I'm so mad at God, but now I'm in, I'm in. I'm like, man, let me tell you, I can't imagine losing my son but God lost his son for you. And I am trying to share Christ, but my son, my son, Jeremy, he wants to do the sharing of Christ. So he's standing behind me going, that's okay, God loves me, I have sinned. I go, son, I got this. This is what daddy gets paid to do. Back it off, boy, back it off. And I am sharing Jesus, and this lady is bawling, and ends up she collapses in my arms, and we all pray together right in the middle of the grocery store. It was awesome. It was awesome. I left. By the time I left, I got my groceries. My little girl sleeping on my arm. I got a bag of groceries hanging from my hand. I'm looking at my son. We're walking out. I go, Jeremy, I am so proud of you. I wanted to get away from that lady, and you saw the unseen. You saw behind the facade. You saw her heart. You saw what was going on, and you shared Jesus with her. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And it was one of those special father-son moments. He looks up at me and he goes, Daddy, are you proud of me? I'm like, yeah. He goes, would you buy me an ice cream cone? I'm like, yeah, I'll buy you a steak and ice cream cone. He saw the unseen. See, sometimes it can happen in the middle of the grocery store. Sometimes it can happen on the football field. Sometimes it can happen in the school cafeteria. You walk in, there's a kid sitting by themselves. You got to see the unseen. You got to see what Jesus sees. That unseen hurt, the unseen hopelessness, and you got to do something about it. The question is, how? How do you get these Jesus eyes to see the unseen? Jesus, in this passage, gives us three keys to getting the eyes of Jesus. Number one, we pray. Matthew uh, 9, 38, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We need to pray for our friends who don't know Jesus. We need to pray for them to come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. You want to get a broken heart for your friends, for strangers? You want to get Jesus' eyes? You've got to begin to pray. Prayer is the most awesome force in the universe. Prayer is when you and I have the opportunity of going straight to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods, the President of Presidents, because He's also our Daddy. 
and we present our request to him. And it, the great thing is when you talk to God, you pray to the Father, and guess what? He hears your prayers, and Jesus is on his right side, interceding on our behalf. And the Holy Spirit, I can imagine him whispering with groans, inutterable groans, reinterpreting our prayers to make them fit for the Father's ears. And the whole Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved in this powerful thing called prayer. You want to get Jesus' eyes, listen, you begin to pray. Not only can you set your school on fire, see God do amazing things, but he will give you the eyes of Christ. And you will see people differently. I love this quote from Samuel Chadwick. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. When the average church in America, the average church service spends more time making announcements than in intercessory prayer, something is broken. That's why standing backstage, one of the most exciting parts, the most exciting part for me of all tonight was seeing you pray to God. Listen, if I could get back in a time machine and talk to myself when I was in my teenage years, I would tell me, Greg, learn to pray. Pray, pray, pray. Because when you begin to pray, great things happen. You want to see your friends believe in Jesus? Pray. You want to see your school rock for Christ? Pray. You want to make a difference with your life? Pray. You want to get Jesus' eyes? Pray. I believe that when Christian teenagers start praying, we're going to see revival. Why? Because there's precedent for that. The great Welsh revival of the 19th century, one-tenth of the total population was not only saved, but plugged into a church. That same equivalent of 10% of America coming to Christ would be over 30 million people saved and getting plugged into a church. And guess who was central to the revival? Teenagers. Here's an eyewitness report written in 1859. One of the most striking characteristics of the movement, I'm reading, was its effect on young people and even on children. The youth of our congregations are nearly all the subjects of deep religious impressions. Very young people, children from 10 to 14 years of age, gather together to hold prayer meetings and pray very fervently. In many places, the young people hold prayer meetings of their own, and these sometimes proved instrumental in bringing in the powerful influences of the revival to that particular locality. The majority of all converts of the revival were young people. Listen, that's great for Wales, but I want to see a revival in America. I want to see a revival in your city. I want to see a revival at your school, in your community, on your team. Here's how it starts. Pray, pray, pray. Youth leaders, lead your youth to pray. Teach them how to pray, and you will see revival. And you will get the eyes of Christ. So you pray. You want the eyes of Jesus, you got to pray. Secondly, you've got to picture. you got to picture people in your mind as a field full of spiritual crops just waiting to be harvested. In John 4, 35, Jesus told his disciples, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. When you go back to your school, you walk down the hallway. I want you to see students differently. I want you to see them as a harvest field, being ready to harvest. I want you to see them with the eyes of Jesus. To do this, you need to exercise your faith and use your imagination. Exercise your faith in what Jesus talked about. You know what Jesus talked about? more than anybody else in the New Testament? Hell. Of the 12 times hell is mentioned in the New Testament, 11 are mentioned by Jesus. He describes it as a place of eternal suffering. Eternity. 
Someone once described eternity as this. If you were to take the earth and you were to transform it into a huge steel ball and you were to put a little ant on that steel ball and it walked around and around that steel ball until it trampled that steel ball into dust, that would be the beginning of the first day of eternity. It's eternal darkness. It's eternal torment fire and brimstone because it represents the anger of God towards sin. God is a loving God, but he also hates sin. It's eternal hopelessness. There is no second chance. There's no way out. Your friends that go there will never escape. I want you to see your friends through Jesus' eyes and have your heart broken by knowing what awaits them. I want you to picture that in your mind. As morbid and painful as that may seem, I remember my youth leader made me do this when I was 12 years old. He made me go to a local shopping mall at a busy time of the, the shopping season and sit on a bench and watch people walk by for 30 minutes. He said, I want you to put an imaginary tag on their forehead that reads, bound for hell. And I kind of thought it was stupid and corny, but I did it. By the end of that 30 minutes, as I watched person after person walk by with that bound for hell sign, on their forehead, and I thought about their lives without Christ, and I thought about their eternity without Christ, I began to weep. By the end of that 30 minutes, I was crying. I was bawling my eyes out because I saw that sign. I want you to see that sign, your friends on their forehead bound for hell, and not just the hell that they're headed to, but the hell that they're going through without a relationship with Jesus Christ right now. I want you to pray, I want you to picture, I want you to proclaim. This is what Jesus did with his disciples in Matthew 9.35. He went through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. You want to get the eyes of Christ, you've got to pray for the lost. You've got to pray for your friends. You've got to pray for your school. You've got to picture them in hell, the hell they're going through right now, the hell they're headed to without Jesus Christ. And then you've got to proclaim to them the good news that Jesus died so they don't have to. I'll never forget Doug. Doug was raised in the inner city. Doug was raised in a very tough neighborhood. And Doug was beat up a lot because Doug was slow. Kids can be cruel. That insult to injury, not only was he slow, he he had epilepsy. He could have a grand mal seizure day or night. So he didn't have a lot of friends because they were embarrassed by him. But Doug fought back with his fists. He got expelled from school again and again. He started getting in trouble with the law. His life was in a downward spiral. But then one day, he went to a camp, a conference, kind of like this one. And there he heard about Jesus. There he heard about Jesus died for him on the cross. How there was faith alone in Christ alone that would save his soul. Not only that, but that he had a mission. That mission was to rescue other people from the hell they're going through and the hell they're headed to. And I'll never forget when Doug came back, he came back on fire because he saw everybody differently. And he wanted them to know Jesus no matter what it took. And Doug would just, he would just talk to anybody. I mean, he had no special segue into the gospel. Somebody would say, boy, it's hot in here. He'd say, it's hot in hell, too. Let me tell you about it. He'd just dive in. He could get away with it because he had this joy in his eyes and his mouth. He smiled all the time. One day, uh, early on a Saturday morning, he wanted to go out and tell people about Jesus. I'm like, Doug, it's kind of early. I don't think anybody's up yet. He goes, come on, let's go. So we went out looking for somebody to talk to about Christ. Doug's getting frustrated. He's like, where is everyone? I said, they're still in bed. We went to this park, and about 100 yards away, we saw what looked to be an eight-year-old boy playing on a jungle gym. And Doug finally found somebody to tell about Jesus, because he knew this kid needed Christ. And he just yells, there's one! And started running at this kid, screaming, hey, kid, where are you going to go when you die? And the kid was terrified. He goes home and ran as fast as he could. Doug came back all discouraged. I said, Doug, you scared that kid to death. He goes, I didn't mean to scare that kid. I just, I look at that kid and I want him to know Jesus. He saw the unseen. Doug saved up his money. 
but a bicycle. Took that bicycle all over the city streets of Denver doing drive-by evangelism. Pulled up to a stoplight one day. There's a car full of guys next to him. But he doesn't just see a car full of guys. He sees them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He bangs on their window. They roll down the window. He begins to share the gospel. They begin to listen. They have no idea what's going on. The light turns green halfway through the gospel. And they go, we got to go. He says, well, I'm not done yet, so I'm going with you. He holds onto the handle. He says, drive. And they take off. And he's sharing the gospel. They go on 10, 20, 30, 40, 45 miles an hour. Doug's sharing the gospel. He gets finished. He goes, I hope you believe. And he peels off to safety. Later on, he tells me this story. I said, Doug, you're an idiot. <laughs> you could have got sucked under those tires, run over, and killed. He goes, it'd be worth it. It'd be worth it. If those guys could come to Jesus, it'd be worth it. Forty years later, Doug is a custodian in Des Moines, Iowa, at a school and he's that custodian. You know what I'm talking about. He's the smiling custodian, the whistling custodian, the happy custodian, the one who talks to the kids, the one who engages them in conversation. But he goes a step further. He prays with students. He shares Christ with students and teachers and principals. And he knows he could get fired, but he doesn't care. And every couple of weeks, I get a call from Doug. And in many of those calls, he tells me about the latest person he's told about Jesus. Because Doug, this custodian, sees people differently. He sees people with Jesus' eyes. He has compassion on them because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And one day, at the judgment seat of Christ, when Doug's name is called, there will be thousands who stand and applaud this one epileptic, slow custodian who had the eyes of Jesus. Thousands who applaud because their lives were impacted and infected and affected by him. Thousands who applaud because God used him in powerful ways. And I will be one of them because Doug is my big brother. He's seven years older than me. And he had every reason not to share his faith. But he had Jesus' eyes. And he couldn't help himself. And I know if my big brother can overcome his inabilities and disabilities and disadvantages to share the good news of Jesus, to pray, to picture, to proclaim, to see the unseen. I know God can use you too. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to think of one friend who doesn't know Jesus right now. Think of that friend. Maybe it's a classmate, teammate. Maybe it's a family member. I want you to pray for them right now. Pray for them. Pray for them to believe the best news on the planet, that there's a God who loves them so much that he died on the cross, died a horrible death, had a glorious resurrection so they could be he could be united with your friend. Pray for them right now. Not only do I want you to pray with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to picture them. I want you to picture this sign on their forehead, bound for hell. And I want you to think about the hell they're headed to and the hell they're going through apart from Jesus Christ. As morbid as it may sound, I want you to imagine your friend in a million years from now in hell. As morbid as it may sound, I want you to think of your friend in the room right now, living through a hell of cutting or quiet desperation, or getting caught up in the world of pornography. I want you to picture their pain. I want you to see the unseen. And now I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Will you make a commitment right now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ with them 
this week. Maybe that means getting on the phone with them, sending them a text that we need to talk, writing them a letter, but that you're going to do your best to begin that conversation and share the good news of Jesus with that friend because now you see them with Jesus' eyes. You see the unseen. And if you're willing to make that commitment that in the next seven days, you're going to begin that conversation. You're going to begin to share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what it takes. If you're willing to make that commitment right now with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, I want you to raise your hand and let me know who you are. Wow. 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 Hands all over. Wow. You can put your hands down. Praise Some of you couldn't raise your hand with your heads bowed. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Some of you couldn't raise your hand. You couldn't raise your hand because you can't have the eyes of Jesus because you don't have the heart of Jesus. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. But you can't have a relationship with him tonight. Just like that preacher told my Uncle Jack, it's not by being good. It's not by going to church. It's not by living a good life. It's by simple faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. If you believe that Jesus died for you and you trust in him, just like you're trusting in that chair to hold you up, then he forgives you for all your sin, past, present, and future. Those sins are nailed to the cross. If you simply trust in him, you have everlasting life. It doesn't start when you die. It starts as soon as you believe. Jesus said in John 6, 47, I tell you the truth. If you trust in me, you have everlasting life. So maybe you came here today not knowing for sure your sins are forgiven, not knowing for sure that you have a relationship with God, not knowing for sure that you go to heaven when you die. You can know it tonight. If you're trusting in Jesus, you can let God know through the simple prayer what you did in your heart. Silently pray this to God. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I fall short. But I believe. I believe that Jesus died for me. And I trust in him. I receive that gift of eternal life right now through faith. With heads bowed and eyes closed, my friend, if you just trusted in Jesus... Your sins are forgiven. You have a new daddy. You have eternal life. Not because you said a prayer, but because you trusted in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And I want to know who you are so I can pray for you. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, if that made sense for the very first time, you trusted in Jesus tonight. Can you simply raise up your hand and put it right back down? God bless you and you. God bless all of you. Anybody else, just raise up your hand and put it right back down. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all of you. Pass out of death into life. Let's give God a hand right now. Amen. Praise God. Youth leaders, one youth leader from every group, I want you to stand and I want you to walk to the aisle that's closest to you. Just stand up, one youth leader from every group. Stand up and walk to the aisle that's closest to you. Let's give our youth leaders a hand. Just walk to the aisle that's closest to you. Stay by your students. I love youth leaders. You know why? They do what they do, not for the pay, because there's not a lot of it, for the payoff. The payoff is when you know your kids have come to Christ or have decided they're going to live for Christ. Now, many of you in this room put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Your youth leader wants to know. In a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to let him or her know. Many of you, many, many more of you made a decision. You're going to tell your friend about Jesus. And your youth leader wants to know that you're going to do that. Because they want to pray for you. They want to encourage you. They want to train you. They want to coach you. Right, youth leaders? So if you raise your hand and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or you raise your hand and say, I'm going to tell my friend about Jesus in just a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to get up and make your way to your youth leader, and you're going to look in his or her eyes, and you're going to say, yes, tonight I trusted in Jesus. Or, listen, 
I'm going to tell my friend about Jesus. My friend's name is, and then let him know, or her know. And when you look in his or her eyes, I want you to imagine you're looking in the eyes of Christ himself. Because Jesus is here with us tonight. Amen? 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 I'm going to pray. When I say amen, you stand up, you make your way to your youth leader, and you let him know if you trusted in Jesus. Or you let him know if you're going to tell that friend about Jesus. Let them know your, the name of your friend. They want to celebrate with you tonight. So when I say amen, you stand up and make your way and let him know, let her know. Let's pray. Father, do a mighty work right now for your maximum glory. May we have the eyes of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up, make your way to your youth leader. Let him know the name of that friend you're going to tell about Jesus. And if you trusted in Jesus tonight, let them know tonight you believed. Let's give God a hand for this, amen? Look at this. Let them know the friend, the name of the friend. Look in their eyes and tell them. They want to pray for you. They want to encourage you. Some of you may have to wait a little while. If you're other adult sponsors in the group, just kind of cut that line in half and start talking to kids. And you're going to have a small group time after this where you guys get to kind of debrief this time. Talk about the friend you're going to reach. Share with others if you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Keep standing in line. It's worth the wait. One more time, let's give God a hand for what he did here tonight, amen? What he's doing. And let's worship our God together, amen? Amen.